This was supposed to be the pivotal year for the Gophers. The schedule is about as friendly as it can be, and they had a chance to bring all four rivalry trophies back to campus. But today, with Floyd of Rosedale on the line, the Gophers just couldn't get anything going. After a defensive first quarter, Iowa struck twice in the second. Jake Rudock keeps it himself and gets in from four yards out to give the Hawkeyes a 10-0 lead. Then late in the quarter, Rudock goes to the air. He hits Damon Powell, who will do the rest. No one can catch him. That's a 74-yard touchdown, and Iowa was up 17 to nothing at the half. The Gophers finally got going in the third. Philip Nelson hits Derek Ingle. That's a 23-yard touchdown to cut the lead to 20 to 7, but that's all the offense the Gophers could muster. And Floyd is headed back to Iowa City as the Hawkeyes win 23 to 7. You know, they got in a rhythm and we didn't and uh, they were able to, to you know, make, make some plays in critical situations, and, and we didn't. It hurts. It's supposed to hurt. But we can't let it affect, you know, the, the, this next week the Big Ten Conference is a major conference, and every game is a big game. So uh, let it hurt tonight. Uh, watch the film tomorrow, but uh, Monday's a new week. The Little Brown Jug will be on the line next week as the Gophers travel to Michigan, and that's a trophy Minnesota hasn't won since 2005. At TCF Bank Stadium, Keith Leventhal, CARE 11 Sports. The Gophers knew that Florida would be a very tough third round opponent. And for the second 20 minutes of the game, these two teams were pretty evenly matched. But those first 20 minutes, that was a different story. Florida came out hot and just hit everything early on. They shot 65%. Mike Rosario had 17 in the first half alone. And this Casey Prather dunk with a minute left in the first half put Florida up 23. Andre Hollins did get hot in the second half, scoring 14 of his 25 points. And this Austin Hollins bucket cut the Gators' lead down to just seven, but that's as close as Minnesota would get. They end up falling 78 to 64. A good effort, but just not enough to dig out of that early hole. Uh, we couldn't get any stops. We, you know, our, our, we, we pride ourselves on defense, and that definitely didn't happen in the first half. We got 30 points in the first 10, 12 minutes of the game, and which was unacceptable. We just came out a little flat. Uh, you know, let the shooters get hot early, and uh, you know, we weren't really communicating on defense, and uh, you know, we paid for it. Well, I just think, you know, they just came out really aggressive, and they were knocking down a lot of shots, and uh, when teams are knocking down shots like that, it's, uh, it's tough to stay in the game. Minnesota ends their season with a record of 21 and 13. The Gophers will now say goodbye to Trevor Mbakwe and Rodney Williams, but the good news is both Andre and Austin Hollins will be back next year. In Austin, Keith Leventhal, CARE 11 Sports. In most big games, it's the veteran players that step up and make a big difference. But last night, in game one of the Western Conference quarterfinals, it was the Wilds' younger players with no playoff experience who made a big impact. Jason Zucker, Jared Spurgeon, and Charlie Coyle combined have the exact same number of shots as Miko Koivu, Zach Parisi, and Ryan Suter. And head coach Mike Yo was happy with how his young guys played. I thought for, again, for playoff experience guys stepping into that moment and, and performing the way that they did, I thought that that's a good first step. But that said, it's, you know, again, we came out on the losing end and we have to, we have to come back and be better the next game. But while the veterans were quiet in game one, don't expect that in the rest of the series. We'll have to see and find things we can do a little better. I think we can hold on to the puck a little more and um, control because that's that's just one of the strengths of our line and it's been one of the strengths this whole season is is protecting the puck down low and I don't think we did a very good job of it last night. You know we feel like we had a lot of good chances and um we just weren't able to capitalize, and we feel if we get a little sharper, then we'll have a lot better chance. One other interesting veteran note, Ryan Suter played a game-high 41 minutes in the game one loss, but just over 12 hours after that game finished, he said he's feeling good and is ready for Friday's game two. At the XL Energy Center, Keith Leventhal, CARE 11 Sports. Good morning from Indianapolis. Game four, not a good one for the Minnesota Lynx. Quite frankly, this entire WNBA Finals has not been good for the Lynx. Brutal, just physically and mentally for them. Really nothing going their way for the better part of four games. Last night, they did shoot and rebound better than they did in game three, but the shots never fell when they needed to fall. And just to cap things off, Simone Augustus, one of their stars, shot three for 21 from the floor. And as you would expect, all the players were down in the locker room, but they weren't pointing fingers at each other. They just say it wasn't their year. We fought hard, and that's all you can really ask for. Um, you know, Indiana played great, and obviously they deserved to win. We didn't give up, and we didn't stop playing for a moment. But, you know, tonight they were the better team, I think. They, they deserve everything that they have achieved. They're a great club and, you know, 
it was it's their time. Now there is some good news for Minnesota. They have made the finals now in back to back years. That's not an easy thing to do. And they have got a great core of young, talented players, including three Olympians. So it's not going out on a limb too much to say they'll probably be back here in the finals once again in the future. In Indianapolis, Keith Leventhal, Carol Evans Sports. Last week at home against San Diego, the Vikings offense struggled while their defense played very well. This week in Houston, the story was basically the opposite. The offense looked almost unstoppable at times, but the defense had a few issues. The low point for the defense came in the second quarter when John Beck hit Devere Posey. It's an 80-yard touchdown pass to the rookie from Ohio State, and it gives the Texans a 14-3 lead. The Vikings would come back late in the half. Sage Rosenfels hits Devin Aroma Shadu. It's a 59-yard touchdown pass. Cuts the Texans lead to 14-10 at the break. Third quarter, the Vikings are hooking up on another long touchdown. It's McLeod Bethel Thompson to Jarius Wright. The rookie from Arkansas gets into the end zone. That keeps the Vikings within four. It was still a four-point game late in the fourth quarter. One last chance for the Vikings, but Bethel Thompson can't hit Mickey Schuler, and that'll do it. The Vikings lose 28-24, but there are some good things they can take out of this game. You always want to win, you know, whether it's a preseason or a regular season season but uh, you know I think we did a lot of good things out there as a team and uh, you know I think everyone's happy to get on with the regular season. There were a lot of things that happened in this game by our players that will definitely make it uh, a challenge for us as we're trying to determine you know who are going to be our final 53 which is a problem you like to have. I mean we had a lot of guys competing tonight they really stepped up in, in a number of different positions and you know we've got a, a, a lot of things to discuss to determine who, who are going to be the guys that help us in 2012. Most of the Vikings starters didn't play in this game, so they should be well rested when the regular season gets started. Game one for the Vikings will be on September 9th when Jacksonville comes to the Metrodome. In Houston, Keith Leventhal, Care 11 Sports. The Gophers played their best game in months against Texas Tech in the Meineke Car Care Bowl. They controlled the time of possession, their offense clicked, and they actually held the Red Raiders offense in check. But in the end, it came down to a few plays that just didn't go Minnesota's way, and that's how this season comes to an end. I think we did everything we could to win a game, and uh, we just didn't make a play, and that's not a quarterback's fault or receiver uh, or anything of that nature. We just didn't make a critical play, and we made some errors that uh, we, we, we wish we wouldn't have made. Any team would want to win, but hey, I mean, we, we're looking forward to the next year, and like I said, like I told feel in the, in, the, in the locker room that things like this happen. You just got to use it as motivation. It's just something you got to build off of. Despite losing in a bowl game and finishing the season with a 6-7 and seven record, the Gophers are still happy with the progress of this program and are excited to continue moving it forward next year. This game's going to put a huge chip on our shoulder. You know, we were so close and now we're going to have this bitter, bitter taste in our mouth. And, you know, a couple of the guys are already talking that we're just excited to get into the off season and, and work even harder. We have progressed throughout the season, and now we know where we need to go for next season. I know where we were when we took the job, where we were a year ago and where we're at now, and there's no comparison. Coming here and, and uh, having the opportunity to win and, uh, and the way we played, um, you know, there's no question in my mind that uh, you know, we're moving forward. This was the Gophers' fifth straight bowl loss, and they do say goodbye to a very talented senior class. But Minnesota brings back a lot of good young players, including their starting quarterback, and they're already excited to kick off the 2013 season when they take on UNLV in late August. In Houston, Keith Leventhal, Care 11 Sports.